I cannot do this anymore, so I need you to either relieve me from this trial or I need you to take me home now. I need you to trust me because this is going to get harder and I know it's gonna feel like you can't get through it but if you will remember me I will get you through it I um, I was going through a really hard divorce and separation and um, a single mom raising still helping raising my three children from a previous marriage, um, ranging at that point 16-ish to um, 21, almost 22. And I was ex um, extremely depressed, would be putting it mildly. I had gotten to a point with medications and reactions to things that I was basically in fight or flight constantly, unable to sleep. I maybe would go out for a half hour at a time and I would just jolt awake in a panic. I'm diagnosed with severe um, PTSD and um, medications weren't helping. At one point I had serotonin syndrome and, um, and figuring that out all on its own was a miracle in my opinion. I had um, gone to sleep with a tablet, listening to a conference talk. I had done no research on anything. And a typical night, I couldn't sleep, so I listened to a conference talk. I fell asleep towards the end of that. Um, I remember dozing off and feeling at peace. And then I woke up startled. And um, I sat up, and on my bed, on the tablet, was an article on serotonin syndrome and I thought and I and I just felt the impression you need to look at this and so I did I read it and I'm panicking as I'm reading through the list and I've had every single symptom but death um, I looked at that I literally kind of went into a panic and I said to the Lord I cried out to him and said I can't do this anymore and you have to understand I'd had a near-death experience when I was 29 and I was told at that time that I would have the opportunity to go back. That if things were too hard, he'd be mindful of it. And so I kind of had this in my head thinking, okay, you made that promise to me. I need you to keep it. I cannot do this anymore. So I need you to either relieve me from this trial or I need you to take me home now. As I'm going through this, this I get this really calm reassurance from the Holy Ghost saying, okay, Annie, it's going to be okay, which relaxed me okay. for the next statement. I, was, I need you to trust me because this is going to get harder. And I know it's going to feel like you can't get through it, but if you will remember me, I will get you through it. And I called my family still in a panic and they came to my rescue we went to the emergency room and it was at that point that i was led to a specialist and it was determined as a last resort um, to do electronic convulsive therapy also known as ect or shock therapy we start therapy and each time I kind of get more and more quiet, I'm sleeping, like I'm sleeping 18 to 20 hours a day. So I think everyone's thinking initially, this is good. <laughs> Come to the fifth treatment, my mom realizes something's not right. Mm -hmm. Annie's not talking. I would not answer to things. I just would sit with a blank stare. And so I could get through the motions. They were able to get me to go through the motions of things like eating and stuff. Um, but I was not able to talk. Okay. So did you think that you wanted to speak and just couldn't or did you not even realize that yet? Um, that early on, it's, I just was so content. Like I had okay. no thoughts to communicate. I was just very content. It was just very peaceful. 
Um, it wasn't scary. Um, it was scary for everybody else. It was else. scary for everybody else. <laughs> and it wasn't until they started expressing their concerns that I realized it was a problem. I always think of my memory as being like a filing cabinet where everything gets stored in it. And as I was becoming more aware, I started to recognize that it felt like somebody had taken the filing cabinet and not only turned it upside down, but scattered everything in a big room. And I had nothing. And as my family started saying things like communicating at the table with me at it, things were starting to slowly go back into the filing cabinet. As they're discussing what, you know, the doctor's concerns and their concerns, I'm starting to understand. They helped me to understand my reconnection with them because I knew now who my mom was, I knew who my dad was, I knew who my brother and my sister-in-law and my niece because they were living in the home. I didn't yet know who my kids were. And so my mom had to leave, had some commitments um, for a weekend or something, and she needed my children, who were 16 to you know almost 22, to um, care for me for a weekend. So this is my first time going home to my condo to be with my children. And so they're preparing me so I understand now, oh, okay, these are my children that I'm going to go be with and stuff. And so these are things going back in my filing cabinet. As we showed up, my mother, um, being busy trying to get everything, she tried to prepare my children because they had yet to see me. And as I go in, um, there's these three beautiful teenagers and young adults in front of me. And as I walk in the door, all of a sudden they're I see their demeanor completely change and they are shocked as I see them. My oldest child had to turn away. You, you're pretty lifeless. If you've ever seen somebody in a mental um, institute who's lifeless or somebody who's catatonic or somebody who's had dementia yeah. and you're kind of not all there and you, you look um, very mm. um, withdrawn, I mean you're just and, and my children were used to me being very lively and energetic. Okay. When we walk in, here I am, no expression. They're shocked. And my mom then comes in behind and says, she tries quickly, okay, okay, this is, remember, this is the routine and stuff to kind of help them break that yeah. tension. Yeah. And, I, and I remember walk, them walking to my room and at some point while I, that weekend, I'm in the bathroom and I see myself in the mirror for the first time. And I look at myself and I, inside, I was like shocked and horror. Horror was like, oh my goodness, who is that? Yeah. And then I realized that it was me. And I thought to myself, I'm scared. And then I remember that earlier experience with the Holy Ghost and being told that it would get harder, but that he would get me through it as long as I would turn to him. Yeah, I told the doctor I was really <laughs> worried because she wasn't talking. I you know, felt like she was catatonic and and he says, Wow, he said, Well, he said, You take her take her to do things that <laughs> she enjoys because that, you know, probably will help bring her out of it. And so I thought, well, I know her favorite place in the world is a temple. So I decided to take her to the temple because I know that's something she loves. And as we were walking out, yeah, I so. saw this lady and she, she just had these bright red shoes on. They just, you know, stood out. I mean, they were uh, really bright and they were suede and there was a platform shoe. And I remember going, whoa, like that. <laughs> And, and then I completely forgot about it. Yeah, and then for me, as we were walking out, um, I, looking down, that's all I noticed, was these bright red suede high heel platform shoes. And so as we left, I had my, my all I could think about was those red shoes. And as, as time went on, um, I just thought about it so much that I was able to say, the red shoes 
my family was like, okay, what, what, what is she trying to communicate? And then the red shoes within a day or two, cause I'm at this point, I'm recognizing I want to communicate. I'm not, and I'm trying to figure out how to communicate what's going on in my head. But as I would communicate, it would exhaust me. They're trying to figure this out, the red shoes. Um, you know, was it Dorothy? You know, she wanting to watch um, The Wizard, Wizard of, of Oz. Oz. Did she have red shoes? Did she, you know, the family just going on. At this point, I'm starting to giggle because I'm recognizing the miscommunication. I'm trying to talk to you about this experience and your you don't understand me and how can you understand me and and every time I'd lay down I'd try to process more in my head to say be able to say more got the impression go to your mom and tell her remember the temple so this is the first time I'm saying something different and I get her to I touch her arm so she looks at me and I say mom remember the temple and then my mother instantly remembers that experience as I say the red shoes are gonna make it okay and, and said, she oh. says oh Annie yeah yeah you've been trying to tell us that it's the temple that will make it okay the red shoes was I had just read an article just just shortly before that talking about how when people are having a difficult time communicating like what Annie was going through that they speak in metaphors mm. and I and I told her that I said so I think you've been telling trying to tell us all all along because the red shoes represented the temple to you in your mind and she's like yeah and instantly <laughs> I could talk it was like it opened up this the filing cabinet and things went in enough that I could talk. It was in slow motion, yeah. probably. And remembering what things were, because I'd forgotten mm -hmm. a lot of things. Yeah. I didn't know what cottage cheese was, for example. It's like I knew, I knew what it was and I should know, but I couldn't remember because I didn't yet have it back in the filing system. So then my family just hit a point where they started reteaching me. Mm -hmm. So at that point, um, I think with my mother's validating me and reminding me the power for me of the temple and the my reminder of the love for the lord and and the importance of faith um it it helped prepare me for the next phase because that wasn't even the hardest part of it things did get harder but it didn't feel as hard anymore because i no longer was left with the attitude of it's it's um you know, you wouldn't give me something harder than I couldn't handle. Why are you giving me this, Lord? It ended up recognizing that you need me to experience this for a reason. Just how I, I look at red shoes differently. So now when I look at people who come into, you know, in situations where they maybe stand out, they look different, I look at it more like as a reminder and I have no idea how it's impacting the other people around me. And maybe somebody else just needs that. I mean, we have no idea, I think, how many times the Spirit's prompting us. And I look back on my experience and how much it, it I can't imagine not having that experience, how much longer it would have taken me before I would have been able to talk or communicate. And so, I think sometimes we don't recognize when our enthusiasm for something is actually the spirit prodding us and saying, yeah, you want to do this. <laughs>